I invite you this morning to take your Bibles and open, please, to the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9 this morning. Have you ever had uh, an opportunity that you missed, perhaps because of your own foolishness? In the Christian life, when we miss God-given opportunities, we forfeit blessings, or we may even bring judgment on ourselves. This is why it's important that as believers, we always stay at a place spiritually where we're ready to receive whatever opportunities God presents for us. This is what we can learn about here in this narrative here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, and verse number 11. Look at verse 11, and they ask him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how is is it written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listeth, as it is written of him. So let's talk about this. this, what's going on here in in Mark chapter 9. Jesus and the three inner disciples, Peter, James, and John, are coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. This This is a great mountaintop experience. It's hard to top seeing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ with your own eyes. That's what Peter, James, and John saw. They got a preview of the coming kingdom, the kingdom of God. This will be something that all of us will be privileged to see one day. Uh, This will be a wonderful time. Now, you remember that the disciples uh, were kind of grappling in their own mind and heart about who Jesus was. They were learning and they were growing in their theology with respect to that. But it all culminated in the great confession that Peter made in Mark chapter 8 when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Everything in the Gospel of Mark kind of leads up to that climactic moment. Everything flows from it. And to affirm what what Peter basically declared, uh, it was verified in chapter 9 with their eyes by the transfiguration. So look in chapter 9, look in verse number 1. Again, where it tells us about this, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, And verily he said unto them, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there will be some of them which stand here which shall, not, which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. The word kingdom there, basilia, can mean royal splendor. And what Jesus was saying, there are some of you here that will see, they'll get a preview of the royal splendor of the kingdom. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. They saw the glory of Christ. Again, that'll be something that all of us will see one day. We will be privileged to see the glory of Christ, to live in that glory. That is answer to the prayer that the Lord Jesus prayed in John 17, when he said, Father, I would that they see my glory. And God will answer that prayer. Now, as they're coming down out of the mountain, there is still a lingering question that they have in their mind. Look in verse number 11 of chapter 9. And they ask him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias, or we could say Elijah, must first come? This was this one question in their mind. It was a question about Elijah the prophet. Maybe this was on their minds because in the transfiguration experience, they just saw Elijah the prophet. And so they said, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? Now, keep in mind that the, they, the, any doubt that they had about who Jesus was was forever settled. They never doubted again that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But with that being said, uh, the Bible says, and the scribes who understood the Old Testament knew that before the Messiah would come, Elijah would come first. And so this was based on Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. In the ancient Near East, kings and rulers were preceded by a herald or a forerunner. Their job was to make sure that everything was prepared for the king's arrival. Isaiah also described the work of the forerunner in Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. So before the Messiah's arrival, there would be a messenger who would prepare the way of the Messiah, and then the Old Testament further describes who this messenger would be. Malachi 4.5, 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before the Messiah would come, Elijah would come and he would restore the nation by calling people to repentance. He would bring the people together. He would be the restorer. Now, this was very popular Jewish belief based on Old Testament scriptures. And in fact, they embellished this whole prophecy, the Jews did. They didn't just say Elijah had to come first. They believed he would be the great reformer who would bring holiness out of unholiness. He would bring order out of chaos. They believed that he would destroy all evil. He would make everything right so that when the Messiah came, all he had to do was to take control of what Elijah had prepared for him. So they saw Elijah as the true restorer. Now, the disciples were absolutely convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. But that being the case, where was Elijah then? If Jesus was the Messiah, where was Elijah? Was he not present? Why was he not performing all the duties that was prescribed for him in the Old Testament? Now, this was a question that no doubt was posed to the disciples by people on many occasions. If your master is the Messiah, like he claims, where is Elijah? What about that? And so this was an answer that the disciples could not give because they were unclear. They were unsure about all of this. And so when they're coming down now from the Mount of Transfiguration, it is assured in their heart that Jesus is the Son of the living God. And so they ask this question, Lord, why then do the scribes say that, the, that Elijah has to come first? Are they getting that right? Did we miss Elijah? How does all this work together? And then I want you to notice Jesus' answer to them because this is a, really, he makes two things clear, a very clear answer, verse 12. And he answered and said unto them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And then drop down to verse 13. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come. In other words, Jesus said, the scribes are right. Elijah is indeed supposed to come before the Messiah and make things ready. Uh, but he goes on to say, Elijah did come, and many people missed him. He was here. Now, this Old Testament prophecy was not talking about a reincarnation of Elijah or that the literal Elijah was the person who was going to come, but that someone would come and minister in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke, in his gospel, kind of gives us the inspired quote of Malachi's prophecy. Listen to what Luke said in Luke 1.17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Here is Luke quoting directly from Malachi, and in this inspired quote, he adds that he will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. So this would be an Elijah-like person, not the literal Elijah, but someone who was cut out of the same mold as that Old Testament figure, Elijah. Now, who do you think would fit that description? John the Baptist, right? Now, again, this can be somewhat confusing because in John chapter 1, verse 21, the Jewish leaders came to John the Baptist and they asked him the question directly, are you Elijah? And you remember his response, he said, I am not. Now, he was right. He was not Elijah. He was not literally Elijah. But he was the one prophesied about in the Old Testament that would come and prepare the way for the Lord because further on, the Jewish leader said, then who are you? If you're not Elijah, who are you? And this is what he said. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as, pro as, as said by the prophet Isaiah. And so he's basically, John's saying, look, I'm not the literal Elijah, but I am that one prophesied about in the Old Testament, the messenger who was to prepare the way for the Lord. He, he, he was saying, I am the one that has come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, these religious leaders, they were unable to connect the dots. 
They just couldn't see it. And neither could the majority of the Jewish people there. They did not see that John the Baptist was indeed the fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy about the coming of Elijah. He was that Elijah that was to come before the Messiah. And by the way, if you compare the two, if you look at Elijah in the Old Testament and you compare John the Baptist, you can see that they are cut out of the same mold. For example, um, the Bible says in 2 Kings 1 that Elijah wore a girdle of leather. In Mark chapter 1, verse 16, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of leather also. Both men were uncompromising in their preaching. Both men were persecuted by women. Elijah was threatened by Jezebel. John the Baptist was put in prison and later beheaded by Herodias, the wife of Herod. Both preached at a time when there was spiritual blindness and hardness of heart. Elijah did come, but he came in the form of John the Baptist. So for those who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, John the Baptist was indeed that Elijah figure that was prophesied. And this is what Jesus tells them. But he also tells them a second thing. He makes another point clear. Look again in verse 13. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listeth as it is written of him. Elijah was rejected by the people. Notice what it says. They did to him whatever they wanted. And notice that expression, as it is written of him. This is a comparison that Jesus makes between the two. In other words, what he was saying was, what was intended for Elijah in the Old Testament was fulfilled by John in the New Testament. What was intended for Elijah in the Old Testament? What did they want to do to him? They wanted to kill him. That's what they wanted to do. And Ahab and, and Jezebel, Jezebel especially made the threat, I'm going to kill you. But you know what? She could never get her hands on him. And later he was translated into heaven by a chariot of fire. So even though they wanted to kill him, they couldn't kill him. However, in the New Testament, John the Baptist, he fulfilled that. What was written about Elijah was fulfilled by John because Herod and Herodias did get their hands on John the Baptist. And what did they do? They threw him in a prison. And then later he was beheaded. He was killed. And so there's a sense then in which the pattern is clear. Elijah was rejected and persecuted. The Messiah's forerunner will be rejected. The one that would come in the spirit and power of Elijah will be rejected. And he will be killed. Although they couldn't kill Elijah, they will kill him. And the Messiah himself will be rejected and will be murdered. And so the kingdom, in a sense, will be postponed. And then later there will be another Elijah-like figure. And so John the Baptist really is a a fulfillment of the Old Testament um, person of Elijah in the sense that he came in the spirit and power, and he's a preview of the second coming when another Elijah-like figure will come before the return of the Lord. And so the religious leaders and the people could not see nor understand that John the Baptist was that Elijah. So therefore, they rejected him, And more importantly, they rejected the Messiah. And by doing this, you know what happened? They missed the greatest opportunity ever given to man for salvation. They missed out on God's day of visitation. They missed out on the greatest blessing ever. We certainly don't want to make that same mistake. We don't ever want to miss out on what God has for us. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves as we study this is why did they miss this? How could they not see this truth? And I want to give you two reasons this morning, two reasons they missed it, and where we need to be careful that we don't make these same mistakes. The first reason that they missed this is because I would say, number one, a lack of illumination. What do I mean by illumination? That's when the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see spiritual truth. This is called divine illumination. This is what the psalmist prayed when he said, Open thou mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Beloved, unless God opens your eyes, you're not going to see the truth. 
God has to be the one who opens your eyes. This is what Paul meant when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, neither ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Now, when we quote that verse, we normally quote that in reference to heaven. And that's okay. However, I would remind you that that's not the context of this verse here. When this verse is being used here, it's what it's talking about is we're not able to understand spiritual truth even though we might see things with our eyes and hear with our ears. If we use the normal ways of learning, if we use logic and observation and the five senses, the empirical ways of how we learn, how we get knowledge, if that's all we have, then we're not going to ever really understand spiritual truth. You have to have a sixth sense. There has to be something else. You need something more than just being able to read it or hear it. You need the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Paul said in verse 10 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. You see, you need to have the Holy Spirit open your eyes, Even though you might have all the other ways you normally learn, you need something more than that. God's not asking you to shut down your brain. He's just asking you to use all of that, but then you need something beyond that. Reminds me of the preacher who was very nervous his first uh, time to open in prayer, and he prayed, and he meant to say, Lord, illuminate our minds. Instead, he said, Lord, eliminate our minds. God doesn't want us to eliminate our minds. We need to use our minds. We need to use all the normal ways we learn things, but we need something more than that. We need something extra if we're going to understand spiritual truth. And what do we need? We need the Holy Spirit to reveal these things to us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He reveals to us the deep things of God. I I like to use the illustration, you know, no one knows me better than my wife, Carolyn, but I know myself better than she knows me. Why? Because the Bible says the spirit of man knows that man. If I could take my spirit out of me and put it in her, she would know me even better. She would know the deep things of Jerry Harmon. That's not possible for me to do that. However, did you know that God is able to do that for you? God is, when you get saved, he gives you his spirit. Why? so that you can know the deep things of God, so that you can understand spiritual truth. And if all you have is empirical ways of learning, observation, logic, and all that, you're not going to understand spiritual truth. You might be very smart. You might be a very high IQ. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to get it. I remember when I was down at Johns Hopkins taking a Ph.D. seminar and reading biblical Hebrew, we would sit around and read Hebrew out of the Old Testament, and then we would give an interpretation and then a translation, and we were reading some of the great messianic passages in the book of Isaiah, and all the students in that doctoral seminar, they were from elite universities, very, very smart, very high IQs, much smarter than me, but when we got to some of those passages in Isaiah, it was my turn to read. I would read, I would, I would translate, I would give an interpretation. I would always give a Christological interpretation. I would always see Christ in that passage. And you know what they would say? I, I don't see that. I don't see that. You know why they couldn't see it? Because although they were very smart, they didn't have the Holy Spirit revealing it. I'm not smarter than them. But you know what? I do have the blessing of having the Holy Spirit of God in me, opening my eyes to see spiritual truth. And I've met people that didn't have a big education that were spiritually taught. They knew more of spiritual truth than many people I have ever met. I know have met people that have a PhD after their name, and they're spiritually ignorant about the things of God because you have to learn by the Holy Spirit. Now, these scribes, they had the Old Testament. They had the prophecies in Malachi and Isaiah. They knew about the coming of Elijah. But what they did not have is they did not have divine illumination. They did not have the Holy Spirit opening their eyes. And so, therefore, they could not see who John the Baptist really was. 
They could not see who Jesus really was. Because, beloved, if you're going to see it, you have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. Now, if you leave a service today and say, well, I didn't get anything out of that service. Well, my friend, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. I can't do that. I don't have the power to do that. I make truth as clear as I possibly can. But you must constantly pray the prayer of the psalmist, Lord, open thou my eyes. Help me to see. Because when we don't see, we miss out on God-given opportunities. But there's a second reason, I think, that they missed out. And number two would be stubborn unbelief. Stubborn unbelief. Look at verse 13. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatever they listed or whatever they wanted, they did to him. That is, their hearts were hardened with unbelief, and therefore they did to John the Baptist whatever they wanted. They killed him. That's what they wanted to do. They did not accept John's ministry. Had they received John, he would have served as the Elijah that God sent, and they would have received Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, they rejected both. In their stubborn defiance and unbelief, they rejected the forerunner. They rejected the king. And it was a stubborn refusal to receive him. Really, it was a matter of the heart. It was a pushing away. This is Romans 1 where it says, we hold the truth and unrighteousness. That's what mankind does. The Greek word for hold means to hold back. You're pushing truth away. You're not holding it. You're pushing it away. And that's what people do all the time with spiritual truth. They are pushing it away. Why? Because that's the heart of depraved man. Many who persist in their stubborn unbelief are pushing truth away. They're looking for reasons not to believe. And that's certainly characteristic of this crowd. Look in Matthew chapter 11. I want you to see this passage. We're going to close this out with Matthew 11. I want you to look at Matthew 11 because here is Jesus' commentary on the ministry of John the Baptist. Look at Matthew 11. Look down at verse number 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Jesus affirms that John the Baptist is indeed that messenger. And look in verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's high praise from Jesus. Jesus said, this is the greatest prophet born of women. When he says verily, he's emphasizing it. He's putting great emphasis on it. But these people just didn't understand the value of John the Baptist. They didn't understand who he was. They failed to appreciate him. May I say to you that this sounds self-serving. I don't mean for it to be. But God's men, men of God, are God's gifts to the world and the church. And oftentimes they're not really appreciated until they're gone. I have to tell you that I appreciate our founding pastor, Pastor Johnson, more today than I ever have in my life. God's gift to the church. But look down in verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What does Jesus mean when he says that? He says the kingdom is suffering violence. In other words, what he meant by that is there are some who are violently opposing the kingdom. Remember I said they're pushing the truth away, and that was certainly true in that day. There were some that were violently pushing away from the kingdom, pushing it back. However, there were a few, in verse number 12, that were taking it by force. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God may be suffering violence, but there are some that are forcefully pushing through all of that, and they're pushing their way into the kingdom. Understand? Although the kingdom may be suffering violence from some, others are forcibly pushing their way in. I, when I read this verse, I think about that scene in Pilgrim's Progress. If you've never read the book, I encourage you to read it, but there's a scene in Pilgrim's Progress where Christian is the man who is the center of the book, it's all about this man's journey from the city of destruction to uh, the celestial city. And as he's making this journey, he comes across many adventures. He bumps into many interesting people. On one occasion, he went to a place called the House of Interpreter, 
a man called the interpreter. And this man, the interpreter, wanted to show Christian something very interesting. He showed him a scene. And in this scene, there's this huge palace, and the palace represents the kingdom of God. And in front of this palace, there's a big gate, how you enter into the kingdom of God. And in front of the gate, there's a man sitting at a desk. He's got a pen. There's a crowd around the desk. People are wanting to enter into the kingdom. They come, and they have to have their name written down, but there's a problem. Standing behind this desk are warriors, formidable warriors, and they have swords, and they have shields, and they have armor, and they are opposing anyone who wants to enter into the kingdom. And so people are afraid. They're afraid to try to break through and enter in. Except in this, in this scene, pilgrim, or excuse me, uh, Christian says that a man of stout character stepped forward. And he said to the man at the desk, write my name down. And he wrote the man's name down. And this man of stout character picked up a sword. He put on a helmet. He got a shield. And he went to battle with all those men that are guarding that palace. And it's a vicious fight. It's a violent conflict. But finally, this man of stout character breaks through. And he enters into the kingdom. And then Christian, as he's watching all of this, says... There's that wonderful line there in Pilgrim's Progress where he says, I think I know what this means. Do you know what that means? Can I ask you, do you know what that means? You know what it means? It is referring to this verse right here. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent enter into it by force. In other words, you have to strive to enter into the kingdom I know sometimes we present it like it's the most simple thing, but there are times when we must strive. And why do we have to strive? Why do we have to fight to get in? Well, because, first of all, of the uncertainty of the opportunity. You never know when the opportunity is going to come this way again. And because the opportunity is so uncertain, when that opportunity is there, you better not miss it. You better strive. You better fight to make sure that you're part of that kingdom, to enter in. And then secondly, because we understand, we have our eyes enlightened to see the great value of the kingdom. Once you see how valuable it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, there is nothing that's going to keep you out of that kingdom. And that's why Jesus said, under the preaching of John the Baptist, the kingdom is suffering violence. However, there are a few that are violently pushing, violently entering in to be a part of that kingdom. But notice what Jesus said in verse 14. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was to come. Talking about John the Baptist, if you will receive it, if you will believe, if you understand that, how, that the kingdom is here that you can enter in, if you'll receive this, then th this man, John the Baptist, he is that Elijah, which was to come. Look at verse 15. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You better make sure that your ears are unstopped, unplugged. You better be listening because the opportunity is here. But then notice what Jesus says about this generation of people and their stubborn defiance and unbelief. Look at verse 16. But un what, whereunto should I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, This generation of people that are stubbornly pushing back are refusing to see who John the Baptist really is. He is that Elijah. Refuse to receive me as the Messiah. You know what this generation is like? They're like spoiled children that don't want to play, you ever have a group of kids and try to get along with them and they just, they don't want to get along with you. They don't want to play. Growing up in my neighborhood, we loved to play football. Sometimes it was hard to find a football. There was always one guy who came from a, a well-to-do family that always had a football. The problem is he never wanted to play. And when we did get him to play, we had to be careful not to tackle him too hard or he'll take his football and go home. Spoiled little child who don't want to play. 
And Jesus said, this is what this generation is like. You see, in the marketplace back in Jesus' day, the kids would get together and they would play funeral. Let's play funeral. Let's pretend that someone died and let's pretend that there's a minister and, and we'll mourn. And some of the children say, we don't want to play funeral. Well, then let's play marriage. If you don't want to play funeral, let's play marriage. Let's have a pretend bride and groom. We'll have a pretend minister. We'll have pretend attendants, and we'll play the flute, and we'll dance. And they said, we don't want to play that either. We don't want to play funeral. We don't want to play marriage. And this is what Jesus is saying about this generation. Look at verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he hath the devil. He's kind of comparing John's ministry to the more austere, solemn, funeral-type uh, attitude. He was calling upon people to repent of their sin, turn from their sin, get their hearts ready. The Messiah was coming. How did the people respond? They said, oh, he has a devil. And then Jesus came. His ministry was more like a marriage, like a wedding. He was the bridegroom. And it was time for them to celebrate the coming of the groom. But what did they say of Jesus? He came eating and drinking. Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, friend of publicans and sinners. They couldn't seem to be satisfied. They couldn't seem to want to play. And basically what they were doing is they were finding reasons not to believe. But notice what Jesus says in um, verse 19, the last phrase, but wisdom is justified of her children. What did he mean by that? Well, he simply meant that, you know, they claim to be wise. They claim to be wise in rejecting Jesus and John but their actions, wisdom is justified by her children. Your actions show how wise you really are. And their actions revealed that they were not wise at all. Their wisdom was a corrupt wisdom. Nothing can satisfy them. They failed to see the dangerous spiritual condition they were in. They leveled false accusations against Jesus and John the Baptist. These people were religious, but they were not redeemed. They were not saved. And so what does Jesus do in response to that? In verses 20 down to verse 22, Jesus pronounces woe. Look at verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities where most of these mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus pronounces woe against these villages, these cities, who saw the ministry of Jesus and heard him preach along with John the Baptist, and yet they would not believe. In their stubborn unbelief, they pushed it all away, and Jesus said, Woe unto you. Woe unto you. You missed an opportunity. When I was in Israel... I had the opportunity to visit one of these villages, Chorazin, that Jesus pronounced the woe to. You can go over there and see it today. It's this little village on a high hill, right overlooking the Sea of Galilee, nestled right there in the hill. A beautiful view. You can look down and see the Sea of Galilee from there. But when you walk into that village, it's very eerie. You know why? Because it's, it's just completely black with basalt stone. It kind of looks like it has the curse of God on it, if you ask me. Empty ruins, empty buildings, nothing there. And it just feels as if it was abandoned, that the curse of God was on it. This was one of the villages that Jesus pronounced woe upon because they refused to believe, even though they were privileged to have some of the greatest miracles done in their midst. They refused to believe. They missed God's opportunity. And if the buildings in that little village could talk, you know what they would probably say? Elijah was here, and you missed him. Jesus was here, but you missed out. You missed out on the day of God's visitation. Don't be like those who miss a God-given opportunity when it is before you. Let's bow for prayer together today. Father, I thank you for your word and the warnings that it gives to us at times when we need to hear these warnings. 
We love to come to church and be encouraged. We love to come and be comforted. We love to come and be blessed. But there are times, Lord, when we need to be warned. We need to take account of where we are spiritually. And Lord, when you gave us your word, you gave us passages of scripture that serve to cause us to examine our own heart and to warn us not to make the mistakes that others have made in the past. In the past, many have had God-given opportunities, privileges presented before them that they either could not see because they were not dependent upon the Holy Spirit to open their eyes, or they just pushed away out of stubbornness and didn't want to receive it. I pray, Father, that that would not be the case for anyone under the sound of my voice, that all who hear of the blessing of the kingdom, of the exceeding value of the kingdom, will desire to enter it by force, will strive until they are at peace in their own heart, that Christ is theirs, that they are a part of the kingdom. May they not rest until they know that they're safely in the kingdom of God. May we not miss God-given opportunities. With heads bowed and eyes closed, can I just ask you, would you just take a moment and do some spiritual inventory in your own heart, in your own life? Would you just see whether you are in the kingdom, are you safely in? Have you been, are you willing to strive to make sure you're part of that kingdom? Has God opened your eyes to see the incredible value of the kingdom of God, of Christ? And will you respond to that? Will you make sure of your own soul salvation? And maybe there's someone that God has put on your heart. You need to pray for them, for God to open their eyes so they can see the beauty of Christ and they will come. You need to pray for divine illumination for those around you that don't know him. Father, bless these words again to hearing hearts. Use this for your glory and honor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.